Okay. God, you guys are way better behaved than my typical students. They, all, they never stop. They have to shout, please listen to me. So, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm David Wilkins. I'm the uh, faculty director of the Center on the Legal Profession. Uh, and Robert asked me to talk a little bit about some work that we're doing around innovation and careers. Uh, I noticed there are some students in the audience some just students, you know, who are more mature, students of life, you know. Then there's our, all of our teachers, Richard Susskind here, so uh, I'll allow him to, to continue to teach. Um, so uh, feel free to stop me as I go along. I've got some stuff to show you, but I'm happy to uh, stop as we go along, and I'm happy to take questions, and I'll stick around for Isabel's panel, because I always want to listen to what Isabel's is up to. Uh, and so I'm also happy to answer questions then. Uh, okay. So let's just start with some basics about what are the traditional roles in legal organizations, right? For most of our history, you know, whether you're talking about law firms or in-house legal departments or whatever, uh, you know, you've got lawyers and quote, non-lawyers, right? And that's the way legal organizations have always thought about their people, right? And, you know, these are not equal designations, you know, in terms of status within the organization. So lawyers do all the real work and they get all the real perks and they make pretty much all the real money and are considered, you know, the important lifeblood of the firm. And non-lawyers have been traditionally treated as various kinds of support staff, okay? And that doesn't matter, by the way. You might have PhDs, you might have lots of degrees in lots of different areas. You may be actually way more educated and experienced than the lawyers. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but they're not, you know, they haven't had any real formal status inside legal organizations, certainly traditionally, right? And this has important implications for how we think about careers. Uh, so for lawyers, we have a kind of more or less defined career path, right? You come in as a junior lawyer, if it's a law firm, maybe you get hired as a summer associate, and then you become a permanent associate, and then you just kind of step up the ladder, first, second, third year, fourth year, et cetera, in some orderly progression, until you get a mere, I don't know, eight to 10 years in, and either you get to stay and become a partner or you get fired. I mean, no, you get asked to look for other opportunities, whatever, okay, you get the basic idea. In-house, it's a little less uh, structured and it's more of a flat hierarchy but it's definitely there you come in as a junior in-house counsel and then you maybe get promoted to uh, uh, kind of a group manager and then maybe you get to be the general counsel of a division or whatever and if you're lucky you become general counsel of the whole company but it's pretty standard and set out okay and you know the whole idea was eventually in that kind of classic crevasse system way that there were really two kinds of people inside law firms that really mattered. There were associates who were on their way to becoming partner or being fired or finding other opportunities. And then there were partners. And the partners were, roughly speaking, all equity partners. And they were all meant to be, roughly speaking, equal, right? lockstep compensation, voting and decision rights, et cetera, okay? So on the lawyer track, this has begun to fray or unravel or change as we've got more and more categories of lawyers inside of law firms. Let's just stick with law firms for a minute. So. You know, the first thing was you got this distinction between equity partners and non-equity partners. I remember when this is, I don't know, God, 40 years ago, what a friend, no, maybe more like 30 years ago, when a friend of mine uh, made partner at a law firm in Chicago, and I called her up and I said, congratulations, you're a partner. She said, no, I'm an artner. 
I said, what's an partner? She said, that's a partner without the P for profit. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, we got this category and that category has been growing. Actually for a while it was growing radically fast. Many law firms have cut it back because they are worried about the incentive structures. If anybody's interested, we can talk about that. But you get that basic idea. Then you get people who are of counsel or senior counsel, permanent associates. And then most recently, in relation to our world that we're talking about here, are contract lawyers. We've had a huge explosion in the number of contract lawyers in many firms which otherwise present themselves as being classic crevasse system firms which only have you know partners and associates but underneath the surface when particularly for big matters big litigation matters deal matters there might be hundreds of contract lawyers some firms have formalized this by making those contract lawyers uh, kind of connected to the firm so the most obvious example of this is uh, lawyers on demand which was started by uh, uh, Berwyn, Leighton, and Paisner in the UK as a way of connecting their former lawyers as part-time contract lawyers. That then got spun off into a separate company. Axiom, is prop Axiom Legal Services is probably the most famous of the kind of high-end, somewhere between a high-end temporary lawyer agency and some new kind of virtual firm. I actually taught in this very room with Mark Harris, the CEO, when Mark was first starting out. And he was kind of pitching this kind of hybrid model between a kind of uh, agile working, which we would now call it, and some kind of new kind of organizational form. But the point is, what it means to be a, even a lawyer inside a classic legal organization has changed. Um, and in response to this, law firms and other kinds of organizations, this happens in in-house legal departments too, particularly when they hire contract lawyers, have fi I've tried to figure out how they're gonna integrate these new kinds of lawyers into the system. Okay, for those people who are pejoratively called non-lawyers, and let's just be very clear, it's a totally pejorative label. Lawyers are the only people, as I say often, who divide the world into lawyers and non-lawyers as if they are two equal groups. Here's a hint, there are a lot more of them than there are of us. And no one I ever knew liked being called a non-lawyer. Sounds a little bit like a non-human. Uh, but it reflects that there's no career path for people who aren't lawyers inside legal organizations. You know, maybe, I don't know, you could go from being a secretary to an administrator, but even that's not a career, a clear career path. And there hasn't been much of a kind of formalized organizational structure, right? Now, recently, there's been some progress uh, for people who have different kinds of league of roles inside organizations which have been proliferating, right? So, we now have a world in which these traditional practices are increasingly at odds with what clients are wanting. And those clients are either the, you know, think of the general counsel as the client of the law firm, but it also is the business that's the client of the general counsels. And they're pushing for more unbundling and repackaging of legal services and moving towards value billing, right? You probably talked a lot about that already today. And that in turn is producing a whole bunch of new competitors, many of which are not law firms or in-house legal departments at all, but are different kinds of organizations. So you've talked a lot undoubtedly with Richard here about legal tech and, you know, we used to think of that as small startups and now you have big giant legal tech companies like Oracle moving in. Uh, we're likely to see many bigger players moving into this space, particularly as it becomes more profitable and less, regulator less regulated. Um, you've got the big four who are now one of the most important uh, players in the legal space. I just got back, I was in Berlin last week, actually this time, exactly last week, where I was there for a scenic 26 hours. I did see the Brandenburg Gate, but that was about it. But what I did get to see was 250 
EY legal leaders from EY's global legal platform and hear the way they're talking about the legal profession. And this isn't the subject of this talk, but they are coming, okay? And they have lawyers, but they have a whole multidisciplinary team of technologists, product managers, project managers, uh, you know, people who do economic forecasting, they do people who do high level strategy. That's the whole idea of a multidisciplinary team, right? And, you know, you've got people like LegalZoom, which are claiming to be legal architects, which are putting together various kinds of DYI and assisted tools. Uh, and you've got people like Axiom and Riverview and a bunch of other people moving into the legal managed services space. All of this, of course, is putting pressure on that traditional law firm business model, right? Uh, where law firms have typically made money by rate increases and leverage and focusing on bespoke work. But it also puts pressure on the general counsel's offices because now they have to figure out how to source work around a much wider range of providers. Um, there was an American uh, lawyer report on what keeps general counsels up at night and this confirms with stuff that we, I was just teaching about 40 general counsels and senior law firm leaders in an executive program just 15 minutes ago, and they said basically the same thing. Data security and governance, risk and crisis management, fragmented regulatory regimes. These are the things that general counsels are worried about, and they're becoming increasingly problematic as the global economy becomes more integrated not with, or, and protectionist at the same time, as information technology speeds up the time and the, uh, processing transactions, and where you get all kinds of boundary blurring, national boundaries, boundaries between different kinds of organizations, different companies are competing in different kinds of space, okay? And the problem is that these companies with all these complex multidisciplinary problems are facing law firms who have become more and more specialized with their lawyers being more and more specialized at an increasingly early age. I sometimes tell my students, I'm teaching a legal profession class here, I tell them, when I came out of law school, you weren't allowed to specialize. You were required to rotate around you know, the tax department, the litigation department, the corporate department, so you can become a well-rounded lawyer. Now my students are hired into the you know, double backflip project finance, only in Asia, only with uh, venture capital back buddy in Hong Kong. And if they say, well, can I go to Singapore? They say, no, it's a different job, okay? <laughs> so that's a big mismatch, right, that we're creating, right? And so what you're getting is a lot of pressure to create different kinds of people with different kinds of skills. This T-shaped idea is something some of you know from IDEO and design thinking and whatever. It's people who are broad enough up here but also have deep substantive expertise. And a lot of the deep expertise we want are things like STEM, you know, I mean, Richard actually taught himself all of that computer stuff. Actually, he was a computer, he was a serious computer guy way back when. But, you know, we need people like Ron Dolan sitting in the back of the room. We need people who have serious understanding of the ways in which new technologies, but not just technology, you know, serious high level finance, project management, all the other things that are going into this multidisciplinary uh, problem solving. And Therefore, you're thinking new kinds of people to take on new kinds of roles. So, whoop, whoa, what did I do? Oh, there we go. Uh, and we're beginning to see a kind of proliferation of these new roles in the marketplace. So, um, you can see that a lot of organizations are hiring, this probably goes back now 10 or 15 years, you know, former Arthur Anderson partners. Actually, after Anderson blew up, Half the Arthur Anderson partners went to work as COOs inside law firms and legal departments. Why? Because people think they had a lot of knowledge about how to run sophisticated projects and how to integrate workflow solutions. Um, that's now becoming pretty standard uh, across most legal organizations. Have some kind of a COO 
oftentimes that person is not a lawyer. We'll come back to what are the challenges that that creates, right? And we see these roles proliferating in other areas. Take diversity. Used to be diversity was run by a partner or by a committee. Now a lot of firms have hired somebody called a chief diversity officer. Or think about strategy. That used to be what the management committee did. Now they got a chief strategy officer. I just uh, was talking to a managing partner who just hired a chief culture officer. I just know a, a law firm that just hired a chief wellness officer. Get the idea? There's a whole proliferation, institutional elaboration of roles, right? And this is the one that we're most interested in, which is this new legal operations person sometimes called chief legal operations officer, sometimes called chief innovation officer. And this role, as we'll talk about in a minute, has been exploding over the last several years, so much so that they have their own organization. Actually, you'll find this amusing, Richard, that I asked this room full of, I think it were like 45 managing, you know, kind of general counsels from lots of different industries and senior level partners at a law firm. I said, how many of you heard a clock? And like five people raised their hands. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, so here's the issue though. As these roles multiply, what do we do with them? How do we integrate them, right? How do we present that, prevent them from being merely meaningless designations or window dressing, right? Or just increase bureaucratization right, piled on top of one level or another, right? On the other hand, if we don't give somebody the job, then who's doing the job? So, you know, I, some, some law firms, particularly law firms, have said, we don't want to have a legal innovation. Innovation's everybody's job. Okay, how's that going? You know, or, you know, or diversity's everybody's job. How's that going? So, that's the problem, right? We're in this kind of thing between increased bureaucratization and meaningless titles and nobody knows what they mean or nobody's doing. So, we're a research center, center on the legal profession. Uh, you met Brian Fong here. He's our superstar research director. Some of the other people here are affiliated with us, including Ron, we're very blessed to say. And Richard, we try to keep a little bit of his time every time we can. Uh, and we decided, well, what's going on with this, right? And what does this mean, these, this kind of proliferation of these new kinds of roles? And so we do what we do, which is we started a research project. And a central part of it is to understand what these roles are and how they operate. So uh, first thing we do is we do a survey. We do a lot of survey research. You don't have to look at all these categories, but it's pretty comprehensive. You know, who people are, what their demographics are, their career histories, job responsibilities, uh, what they do other than what the innovation role. Do they have a team? What are their stories? What are their budgets? Who do they collaborate with? And we've now got about 250 responses. So we got a pretty big sample. And the best thing about our sample is we have worked very hard to make it sort of evenly divided between companies and law firms, right? To tr because what's one of the issues about clock is basically, law, I think they just decided they would allow, they would deign to have law firms cross their uh, doorway. But basically the mission of clock is roughly speaking, squashing law firms like a bug which doesn't encourage a lot of collaboration across the divide and law firms have a lot of power to resist. And so our view is if you're gonna think about this, you have to think about this as one kind of integrated ecosystem of which by the way, legal education is a piece and you shouldn't let us off the hook, okay? So here's a few things. I'm just gonna throw a little data at you. Happy to talk more about it if people are interested. So we confirm this thing is exploding. So Clock had, uh, at their last meeting, I don't know, were you there, Richard? You were there, right? Hanging out of the pool in Las Vegas. There were like 3,000 people, right? 3,000 people, okay? It started three years ago, like with four people around Mary O'Carroll's lunch table or something at Google. So you just talk about the explosion is really incredible, right? And here's a few things we found out so far, all right? So if you look inside legal departments, here's an interesting fact, 70% of the people are women, okay? 27% have a JD, 
but 49% have built their primary professional careers in law, meaning they might not be a lawyer, but they've worked inside legal organizations. Uh, in fact, 36% of them had worked at a law firm before joining the company. Uh, other bad backgrounds are project management, data analytics, information technology. You know, but law or a legal orientation still is the primary thing, okay? 63% of them report to the CEO. That's a pretty powerful, I mean, to the, to the general counsel or the chief legal officer. That's a sign of power, right? And Mary O'Carroll, for anybody who knows Mary or Connie or whatever, these people are very well regarded by their general counsels. We'll come back and talk about that in a second. Um, the teams are pretty big. And a lot of them have, even if they're not a lawyer, they've got at least one lawyer. But some of them don't have any lawyers. And that's, I think, because in some of them, as we'll talk about in a little, they're being driven more by the, they're more like chief uh, information officers or, or data people, right? That that's where it's being driven from. All right, that's companies. Here's law firms. You can't make this up. 72% of them are men. How's that gonna go? Okay, I mean, these people are supposed to talk to each other. Uh, 22% reported having a JD, uh, but we got a bunch of people with a bunch of uh, higher credentials, and 72% are not practicing, but that means over a quarter are practicing, okay? You don't find that in the company space, much more in the law firm space. Um, again, other backgrounds, information technology, project management, design thinking. This is actually making a big penetration in law firms. We, we take some credit for that because we've introduced a bunch of people to IDEO and design thinking and Hogan Lovells ran a project. So uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, almost all of them have just worked in law firms. Whereas if you go back up here, remember a bunch of them have worked in law firms before going to companies. I think that's a, st a significant statistic. Um, a lot of them in law firms work on a committee. Now, committees can have advantages, but committees can also be committees. And so harder to drive change, maybe from a committee framework. 60% uh, report to the managing partner, but a bunch of them report to administrative leadership. I'll come back to that in a second. And I was surprised by this. But we need to dig in more about how many people were on the team. I think we were both surprised it was that big. Okay. Here we asked, what are your responsibilities? That is, what do you do if you have one of these jobs? Um, it's a little bit hard to read, but let me just point out, these are, when, I say, when it says legal ops, that means it's company people, right? So they're doing a lot with new technologies and processes, data analytics, vendor management. Managing outside law firms is a big responsibility. Here's the part I think is interesting. Very little on creating performance metrics, hiring and allocation compensation levels for in-house lawyers. This so far, I mean, some of these are up at near 40%, but if you talk to people, this is not a big part of their jobs. When I talked to Mary, she says, I said to her, don't you think there's a lot that legal ops can say about the internal management and organization of the law firm? She said, I mean, the law department? She said, yes. But you could imagine it's harder to do this than it is to squash law firms like a bug if you're on the inside of a legal department. Okay, here's law firms. I love this. The two biggest things law firm uh, innovation people are doing are trying to build an infrastructure and creating a culture of innovation. Notice those things didn't show up on the call for the company thing. And you'll see, this will be one of several times you will see that the law firms are struggling to try to get traction on this, to try to build a culture of innovation. Um, and they're doing even less professional development, financial management, performance metrics, setting compensation, and they're really involved in diversity. I don't even feel like zero. Um, Again, it's easy to manage vendors, but if you don't have this culture, it's really hard to drive change inside the law firm. Okay. One of the things we ask people is, 
who are your, who's your support structure and who's your opposition, right? For both uh, in-house people, legal ops people, and for law firms. So this is what the picture looks like for in-house, okay? Look at this. The legal management is really behind us. And that's what I say, you know, the, uh, Kent Walker, when he was the GC, I guess they're still looking for a GC now at Google. They mandate this and they see the value because they are being judged on their legal budgets and their legal efficiency and they're really driving this, right? And that they're getting some buy-in from the legal department lawyers and from professional staff, but law firms are not so helpful. In fact, if we look at resistance, that's a much bigger box than this. The bigger the box means the more people that said that this was uh, important. On the other hand, the legal department lawyers are not exactly fully on board either, right? And there's a lot of resistance around the lawyers of the culture and around money, okay? But management, people do not think is a big block. Now, look at law firms. Their support comes from each other. Okay, and management is kind of a small box, less than this, and yet the management created these roles and gave these people jobs, but the pressure is coming from clients, market forces, right? That's what's pushing this. And where's all the resistance coming from? Deviation from existing practices, partnership, culture, and money's a huge issue. See the different picture? It's much harder to drive these things inside law firms, and that's why we're seeing, I think, less change there. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with a taste, a, 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 a test case. This is a real live test case, and you are going to be able to find out the answer of this real live test case. I've been using this with permission. Uh, since we did our, uh, we did a colloquium at Google where we had about 80 innovation professionals. I see some old friends in the room who've been at several of our, we did one at Google, we did one in New York, and then we did one at Harvard. So we're trying to really build momentum here. Half law firm people, half folks from uh, in-house legal departments. And when we did the thing at Google, I said, okay, if you're gonna make progress on this, you have to convince really bright people to take these jobs. And if you don't convince bright people to take these jobs, it's they're always gonna be second class jobs in which case you're gonna get second class outcomes. So, how are you gonna convince Nea? Here's who Nea is. She was at the time a third year Harvard Law student. She had graduated, you know what, Nea, it's not MIT. Why did I put that up there? You went to Carnegie Mellon. Okay, that's a hint that Nea's in the room. I don't know why I put that up there, sorry. She went to Carnegie Mellon. Master's in electrical engineering, worked with several startups, including two legal startups while in law school. She also worked with Ron Dolan, the guru over there, on a project on quality metrics and bankruptcy filing, which I think Ron would say was really excellent. And uh, she was a student in Ron's 2.0 class, uh, just an outstanding person. And when we went to Google, we gave this presentation and the people from Littler, who are one of the most techno technologically advanced firms, ran up to her and said, how can we work with you, okay? That looks good. She's very interested in something around innovation and legal operations. But here are her options. She's got an offer from Latham. They're gonna pay her $750 million or whatever it is they pay for sure associates these days, you know, to work for a mere, you know, 4,000 hours. But anyway, um, startups love her. You know, look at this background. She's exactly the kind of person who a startup would wanna hire. And Lindler said, if you come, we'll put you in our data group. I said, what's that? I said, it's a data group, okay? So here's the thing, how are you gonna convince Neha to join? She wants this kind of job, but these are her options. And you know, she's got the normal level of risk aversion anybody might have. And she's talking to people like me who are trying to make sure that she protects herself, but also that she does something that's really innovative and in the future, okay? So, 
How can firms and in-house legal departments create career paths for people like Naya, who want to bridge disciplines? You know, law innovation, law computer science, law strategy, law design thinking. Don't let us off the hook. Look at law schools, law firms, and in-house legal departments to recruit more people like this, more people like Neha, who are interested in these kind of careers. And what are our barriers? Who are our supporters and who are our opponents? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Isabel to answer all the questions. I just get to ask them. Thank you very much. Oh, Ron, you want to ask your question? All right. Not that we never talk or anything, Ron. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, that, I, Ron, I think this is a Marshall McLuhan moment, which is we don't have to speak for Naya because guess who's on the panel? So come on down. I'm going to sit. I'm just going to sit up here, and I'm happy to if it comes up as part of the conversation. But I do whatever Isabel says I should. What a cliffhanger! <laughs> Thanks for the heads up, by the way. I was wondering while I was coordinating the panel why one of my panelists doesn't have a job title. Um, so this is all very well managed. <laughs> we are a seamless web. Brian actually came in and said, we're going to set you up real good, but I can't tell you what the last slide is. OK, great. Um, my name is Isabel Yang. Uh, I'm a recent graduate of Harvard Law School. And uh, currently, I'm a founder and CEO of a company called Arbilex. We try to do predictive analytics for international arbitration. But really, I started the company to get invites to uh, cool events like this. So, um, so today we'll have a fantastic panel. We're going to talk about legal tech career. Um, so to my right is this panelist who needs no introduction by now, uh, Neha Sin. And then to uh, Neha's right, we have uh, Carrie Kassem, who's a product manager at uh, LexisNexis and previously at Ravel Law. And then to Carrie's right, we have Jeff Marple, who's the director of innovation for corporate legal at Liberty Mutual Insurance. So um, we're going to divide the next hour into six segments. Uh, we're going to talk about a, typ a typical day at work. We're going to talk about their respective career trajectory. And we're going to do a little bit of myth busting, like what are some of the most fascinating uh, legal tech use cases that they have seen in their uh, line of work. Then we're going to do a lightning round on top three reasons to be bullish about legal tech and top three reasons to be cautious about the sector. And then we're going to end with some career advice and then uh, Q&A. So I'm here mainly for timekeeping. So the panelists would do most of the talking. But um, I guess we have to start with Neha now. <laughs> so uh, Neha, tell us, um, what did you choose and what does your day look like now? All right, um, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, I am working at a startup now and that was the right choice for me because the risk in working for a startup matched the kind of risk that I want to take. The risk in working for a startup is that your product either works or doesn't, you, it makes money or not. The risk is not, will you be supported, like David was talking about in his slides, will you have support from the culture of the firm, or from the partners, will you have enough money to do what you need to do? So that matched what I was looking for. My typical day, I'm happy to say that it does not start with email. That's one thing I always heard when I went to panels like this. So I never check my email. I go to work, and the first thing I do is I type in the Slack channel what I did yesterday and what I'm planning to do today. And then I just do that, and I'll have minimal meetings. I can really focus on my work, go in depth, and it's awesome. I really like it. Fantastic. So um, Carrie, we're going to go with you. Product manager at uh, LexisNexis. What does that mean? What does your day look like? And and um, I think a previous speaker said lawyers are um, sucky at product management. What do you say to that? What does your day look like? I think I think um, well, I'll start with what my day looks like. So um, I'm on West Coast time. Um, much of uh, legal world operates on East Coast time, London time, um, and our developers are. Uh, mostly on the East Coast, some in San Francisco and some in India. So I actually have a 6.30 a.m. meeting um, that I usually attend uh, uh, from my bed uh, at 6.30 in the morning. I dial in for 15 minutes. It's a stand-up uh, with our offshore developers. So I just check in. They, they've usually gone home by that time. Um, 
this was kind of negotiated that they like to go home and then do that um, before dinner. So checking with the engineering, um, usually from about seven to nine, I either um, take a very short nap and then uh, deal with some uh, calls to usually New York um, or to Raleigh where we have, uh, again, our engineers, sales teams, and a lot of our customers. Um, nine to 10, kind of a, usually a late commute. And then from 10, 10 to 11, usually working with our on-site engineering teams, getting things ready for the day on the West Coast. And then from 11 till about two or so, um, I spend about you know, three hours or so a day, uh, if possible, with customers. So um, uh, I can kind of comment on whether or not lawyers make, was it sucky, is that the, <laughs> the technical term? Product managers, is yeah. that the word? Um, I think a big part of product management is being able to empathize with your customer. That doesn't mean you have to be a lawyer to do that. Um, I know, I think the majority of you are either uh, lawyers or soon to be lawyers. It does help. So um, having been a lawyer and then, having gone to law school and then been a lawyer and practiced, it does make it a lot easier to empathize with the pain that customers experience and the opportunities and challenges that they're dealing with. So um, can I answer that side question? Yeah, um, sure. It depends uh, on, the, on the empathy. We'll definitely get back to that. Sure. Um, and then the rest of the day is just individual time. It can go till whenever, and then 6 p.m. it's uh, uh, London, sorry, uh, Tokyo and Shanghai start to um, can finish their commutes. So if we want to check in with them or present what we're doing or learn from them, that's a good time to do it. But it's a 24 hour a day operation. If you're not disciplined in finding some personal time, you will work yourself to death, just like in big law. So. Do you sleep at all? Uh, I actually get my sleep, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I had to learn to do that. So uh, Jeff, you're tasked with um, advancing a culture of innovation within the insurance company. What does your day look like? That's, do you have a typical day? That's one of the things that I do, which showed up on the big law, but not on the corporate, which I thought was interesting. Um, uh, no, I don't have a typical day. Uh, first of all, I'm one of the non-lawyers that uh, Professor Wilkins referred to. Um, in corporate, we call them legal professionals. Uh, so, uh, and I'm actually kind of proud of that. Uh, it allows me to ask really dumb questions um, and uh, what would appear to be naive questions, which usually are, by the way. Um, I don't have a typical day. I do a, a variety of different things. I, I'm, I'm, I really am charged with understanding the, the push and pull of, of the tech ecosystem and the, and the needs within the organization. So I, I gather a lot of intelligence. Um, I might be talking to vendors about a demo. I might be talking to some of our internal data scientists about something that they're building. I might be doing some project management work, uh, seeing where we are on a project, statusing up to our GC on things. Uh, this week, I've been doing a lot of event planning. We're running a uh, design challenge at uh, Suffolk in a couple of weeks here. Um, design thinking uh, it will be preached and taught. And um, for all the students in the room, you should sign up and come on over. It's going to be super awesome. Uh, you should have a flyer. Sorry, that's the pitch. Um, uh, so it, it, it very much varies from day to day, uh, all sorts of different things. Sweet. Yeah. So, um Legal tech, right, as we heard from uh, Professor Wilkins talk, it's kind of a new concept. Well, it's new for depending on which generation you're in. Um, so, so how do we get here? So obviously Neha has definitely the, the right background, the engineering and the law school. So let's unpack that journey a little bit more, right? So you went to CMU, did your computer science, and you just decided to go to law school? Well, yeah, well, sort of. I worked at a law firm as a patent agent for a couple of years, and that's, to be a patent agent, you need to have an engineering background, but not a legal degree. So I did that, and I realized that a lot of the things I was seeing in the way we worked were inefficient, and that bothered me a lot. So I decided to go to law school with the aim of doing something that would make law more efficient. So that was actually what I wrote my personal statement on. I knew day zero of law school that that's what I wanted to go into. And I think you pointed out that that's an a typical path, like not a lot of people know that that's what they want to do, not a lot of people have that background, and I don't want to scare anybody by making you think that that's the only way to do it. So what have you learned in law school? Why are lawyers so inefficient? Um, I think that they've been, they're doing things that used to work maybe 20 years ago, even 10, five years ago, but the world is changing, so now those patterns of working no longer work. 
So, um, Carrie, what about you? Do you agree that lawyers are super inefficient? Your class, um, JD class 2012, right? So um, you graduated and then you went to be a commercial litigator. That's right. Walk us through that path. Sure. So um, I worked in primarily in litigation from around 2012 through I guess, late 2014. Um, there, I had a strong interest in practicing law towards the end of college, applied to law school, enjoyed law school, uh, wanted to practice practiced, um, didn't particularly want to leave practice, but it became very obvious that uh, there are certainly tons and tons of inefficiencies in the business models of law firms, um, even in the legal departments. Um, and so that path towards staying in, in law at a firm for a long time and then going to in-house, that in-house didn't really seem like it was going to be much better from an innovation standpoint. So. My interest in working on systems rather than um, simply representing clients kind of drew me towards legal technology. There were a few starting to sprout in the Bay Area at the time. Um, in this room are some advisors and investors in, in a couple of those, so I um, won't say who. <laughs> and uh, they, it was a really a, um, there, were, there were opportunities to get involved, so I just jumped into it. So um, I want to go a little bit in depth about your role at, at Ravel, right? So I heard this argument about lawyers being inefficient, but like lawyers are not really paid to be efficient. Lawyers are paid to be exhaustive, right? To identify the risk, to issue spot, right? Um, and at Ravel, it's a legal research tool. So how do you kind of reconcile the two parts of you? Like as the tech person, you need to be like super efficient and like talk about technology. But your clients are not really on a, you know, performance metrics are evaluated based on efficiency, that they get punished for not being exhaustive. And, and being exhaustive takes time. So how do you, how do you see those two um, sort of conflict playing out? Sure. So it, um, yes, I think it is a, a very big problem. The, uh, the people who do the day-to-day -day work at law firms, large and small, um, are often not the people who, say, would sign the check for the software that we would be selling. So oftentimes there's a, yeah, there's that disconnect between the people who are trying to become more efficient, um, trying to become more, not just efficient, not just in terms of, uh, some, some clients have a virtually unlimited uh, bankroll because the, the cases that they have are bet the, bet the company type cases, but actually getting the best outcome by any means necessary even. Um, sometimes, sometimes that disconnect between the ownership of the firm and the, um, or the company, and the um, the day-to-day -day work does kind of create problems. We ended up talking very frequently with our customers up front and uh, seeing what kind of problems that they had, what kind of things they're trying to do. Um, we would often find they're very different from again the the interest in billing the maximum number of hours that was kind of in the background when we would talk with the law firm partners. So fortunately, as this tech as technology becomes um, more capable of doing things in the legal space. There's also some shift in the power dynamic between the clients, say anybody, the Association of Corporate Counsel, uh, large law firms, they are putting a lot of pressure, as we've seen at Clock and we see at ACC, um, on a lot of pressure on the, the firms to provide predictable solutions, solve our legal problems, um, let us know how much it's going to cost up front, and submit a request for um, an RFP, and yeah, so. so that, I want to challenge sure, that assumption. You, you said exhaustive, and we're not looking for exhaustive. Um, I'm not a lawyer, though. This morning, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is our this is our job. Um, at a PNC insurer, litigation is very much cost of goods sold. We sell indemnification, and we sell a defense. So it it, it directly affects our bottom line uh, of of every premium sold. Litigation affects it. Uh, Professor Suskin talked this morning about um, a drill. We, we're not shopping for a drill. We're shopping for a hole in the wall. We're shopping for value. We're not necessarily shopping for exhaustive work. Now, sometimes that's the only way that you can ensure whatever it is that you need. But I think as more and more technology comes online and better data becomes available, that value is going to be easier to discern. That's what we're always looking for. We're trying to find value. So that I don't know that necessarily there's been inefficiencies. There just hasn't been the right way to measure it. I, I think that's that's a fantastic point. I think the, the question I should have been more precise is, especially in litigation or high stakes uh, arbitration, you get really dinged by the arbitrator or the judge for missing a case. So sure. sometimes it's it's quite, um, 
nerve-wracking when you have been on that side and trying to deliver technology um, to an audience who are rewarded for being exhaustive, but at the same time, if we try to evaluate them on efficiency, then it creates that disconnect. But we'll definitely come back to that theme in the lightning round. Um, so Jeff, yeah, so tell us, how did you come from software dev and then now find yourself in a room full of lawyers? Yeah, so uh, 19 years at Liberty, 20 in March. First 14 was uh, in software development um, on what's known as a risk management information system. Um, I call it online banking for commercial insurance. I started there uh, answering phones, telling people to turn off their caps lock when they were typing in their password. I ended up managing that portfolio, uh, setting strategic direction and managing production support for the whole platform. Um, then there was a, a claims innovation job uh, that opened up in claims, that's why they call it claims innovation. Um, and I, I moved into our commercial insurance claims innovation uh, newly formed space. Um, and there I worked on infrared cameras and at the time flying drones with my then attorney, Bob Taylor, who's sitting right over there, um, and uh, uh, the beginnings of some natural language processing trying to extract information from our claims notes. Um, from there, uh, a claims innovation role opened up, excuse me, an innovation role opened up within uh, legal, um, and that sounded like an interesting, uh, interesting spot for, for me to go, and so I took that job. I've been there for about three and a half years now. So th that's kind of how I found my way into it. I, one led to the other. Liberty's a big, a big company, and um, different opportunities can happen sort of diagonally. Um, Fantastic. So uh, I think that's a good segue. So having that, you know, uh, straddling of the different departments within an insurance company, um, I want you to take us like through the next question. Like, what are some of the actual um, exciting use case of legal tech that you have seen in in your line of work that were it not for the legal tech, you know, innovation that exists, it would have rendered a much less desirable outcome. So like, what's some cool use cases, yeah. essentially? Yeah. Um, some of it's kind of pedestrian. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of big platforms out there, matter management, e-billing solutions that are out there that are sort of the big sort of elephants in the tech space. We, I like the stuff that's in between. Uh, people talk about digital workflows these days. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how we make, how we can make our work uh, less document-based, less analog-based, more digital-based, and some of the second-level benefits that can come from that. Um, so, uh, so that's a really boring way of saying like intake is really interesting. Automated document management, uh, automated document generation is interesting. Um, we're starting to leverage some of the AI vendors in the space as well uh, to do some extraction from. Um, uh, from uh, natural language documents as well, so that stuff's becoming more digital. I, uh, all of those those two things, um, I think, are starting to lay the network and the groundwork for some of the analytics that will come later once once we have those in place. Uh, we're also uh, really starting to think about um, the data that is thrown off through litigation. We tr tend to have a, a, a we tend to throw off a tremendous amount of data, and we're thinking about we have a in-house analytics team, but we're thinking about different ways that that, that data could be uh, valuable to us and how we can predict what could happen and how we how we procure legal services. Um, we think that's that's a that's going to be a growing space over the next couple of years. That's a very extensive overview. Thank you okay. for that. So I actually, so full disclosure, I just came back from an arbitration conference in Atlanta, and I stole this question uh, about the most exciting use case of technology uh, from that conference Q&A section. Um, and we had a room full of arbitrators and challenge arbitration lawyers, and I think the top three technologies that they agree are the most exciting developments in the challenge arbitration are the following. Adobe, Cisco WebEx, mm. and the ability to insert hyperlinks in Word documents. So, <laughs> so I was like super impressed by this panel. Um, so, <laughs> Adobe? So um, mo moving along to, um, to Carrie, right? So you're definitely allowed to say that the coolest legal tech out there is you know, the one that you're working for. Um, walk us through like, just like how, how does your um, company's product integrate into lawyers' day-to-day -day work? Like why is that a cool thing? Like, why can't we? Well, you're with LexisNexis. I was going to say, why can't we just stick with Lex LexisNexis? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can. I'll go into a little bit of the process of how we came up with the tool, and that, that should help answer it. So, 
Well, when we were trying to solve problems that, uh, say, junior associates um, fresh out of law school or a year or two out of law school were trying to solve, uh, we thought, what's, what's the issue they're trying to solve? It's persuade a judge to agree with them on an issue. So how can you figure out what's going to persuade a judge uh, to agree with you on an issue? And it's look, often it means look at what they've done in the past and potentially that will help you to predict, not necessarily, but predict what they may do in the future. Um, so you, so our software, you can, you can actually access it now. Um, Harvard has access to context. So our early Ravel product, um, one of those early Ravel products has been redeveloped into context, which is a Lexis advance, um, a Lexis offering. Uh, basically shows you what cases a judge has cited in the past. Instead of what cases um, you know, are cited on the issue, let's filter that down to what has the judge that I'm appearing in front of cited in the past. How frequently have they granted a certain type of motion Let's filter that down by um, just immigration cases, or just patent cases, or just uh, patents about uh, software kind of cases. What, what has the judge done on that on that issue? And so, and then what's the language again that they've used when they've um, when they've granted or denied those motions? So if, again, if you're just trying to solve the attorney's job of persuading the judge, um, give them the tools they need to persuade the judge. Uh, so that, fascinating. Yeah. So. I don't, I'm sure that you're aware, um, in some jurisdiction, that is actually a fairly controversial oh, is it? use case, right? So France actually just criminalized uh, judge analytics. Uh, I'm not traveling to Paris anytime soon. Um, so so what, what do you think is the sort of the value add of judge analytics uh, into the, the, the legal system? Does it, so on the one hand, it does give you know, attorneys and additional information edge on patterns and, and history. But there's an alternative argument that I've heard often is, um, are we oversimplifying the, the law? Are we putting practitioners at risk of gaming the system? What do you say to that? So I, I think, I think there's a lot of questions there. I think the, the objective, the reason the legal profession exists is not um, as much as I'd like it to be, it, it is not to just um, help law firms make lots of money. It's also uh, more deeply, we went to law school, most of us, to represent clients who have important issues that are often life or death or uh, bankruptcy or riches or somewhere in between. Um, and so we can't just think of it as a bunch of lawyers trying to game the system for their own good. It's also about doing everything you possibly can um, which is your duty under the professional rules to advocate for the well-being of your client. So our system is set up to be adversarial. Um, large law firms um, and large clients often have massive resources to, um, to use um, in advocating for their clients. Small law firms, solos, where um, Context, for example, has had its, some of its greatest successes um, in the market. Um, small law firms often don't have that ability. And so to even the playing field, you often do um, see benefits in providing um, very powerful tools to individuals. So, um, and then kind of a caveat, if you're, if you're a new attorney um, and you're dealing with a partner at a law firm who has 30 or 40 years of experience, um, you, you often don't have much leverage over your own career. When you, are, um, when you have access to tools that give you um, kind of a, a approximation of that experience by showing you what happens in front of certain judges and what happens in certain courts, you really level the playing field. So I think there's much bigger issues of fairness and justice that come into the equation um, than just the kind of the simple idea of gaming the system. Um, That's a fantastic yeah. answer. Um, so I'm gonna move on to um, Niha's work, which is a lot less um, adversarial setting, right? Um, so tell us uh, a little bit more about like the, the legal tech problem you're trying to solve on a day to day basis, or what is the coolest uh, legal tech application that you have seen, whether it's your company or in your sort of subsector within legal tech? Yeah, um, I'll actually talk about a company that I don't work for, just to be an oddball. But it's something that I've seen both sides of the issue on. So I used to work as a patent agent, and one of the things we did was we would try to write patents that covered the technology well, but we would also want to make sure that they get granted. And in the patent office, if your patent is classified as software, it's very hard to get it granted. But if it's classified as a machine, it's much easier to get it granted. And we had no way of gauging how our patents would get classified. And then I got to law school, and I actually found out this company was trying to solve this problem, so I interned for them. And 
what they just used AI to try to predict. You could paste in your patent and they would tell you, we predict there's a 60% chance it will be classified as software, but there's a 40% chance it won't. And then you could tweak the language and try to increase the chances that it gets classified in a manner that you want it to. So before you even file the patent, before you've even given any money to the patent office, you already have an idea of where you stand and how strong your patent is. And I thought that was really interesting because it's all public knowledge. The technology isn't new. It could have been done much earlier, but it's so great to see it being done and making it more efficient. So what about what do you do at your current company? Is it, is, what's the application? Because I, I do want to get out of the spectrum of, you know, not every legal tech out there is trying to solve like the high stakes disputes. There are the ones that are trying to really just make everyday work of companies a lot more uh, seamless. So can you tell us a little bit more about Shoebox? Shoe yeah, uh, I work at a startup called Shoebox and we automate paperwork for other companies, other startups. So we're automating everything from their hiring paperwork, their fundraising paperwork, their equity management, all of that. So they have to do less of that and they don't have to pay their expensive lawyers to do that when they're still startups and don't have a lot of money. So between that and the patent AI uh, prediction, surely you got an offer from them. So what, was the, what, what did the decision come down to? Um, I was really lucky in that I had a lot of good offers, and I really just felt like I couldn't make a mistake. They were just all fantastic opportunities. So I just picked one, and I don't even know if I had a good algorithm to figure it out. I was super lucky at that moment. Nice. So, um, so let's move on to uh, the lightning round. Okay. So we're going to talk about top three reasons to be bullish and top three reasons to be cautious about the legal tech sector. Um, who wants to start? He's got the best notes. I see them. <laughs> He's going first. <laughs> I only had two reasons. Go for it. All right. I think there's a lot of work left to do. There's just, there's just so much. We're just starting to scratch the surface on what we can do. Um, what we're able to parse and understand from natural language, which, by the way, is the byproduct of most legal work, is um, unfielded data is, uh, is, I think we're just barely starting to scratch the surface of that. So I think there's a tremendous amount of work left here. Um, so that's number one. If is I can that a bullish or is that a cautious reason? No, that's bullish. That means that there's opportunity coming all over the place. Um, so we're just starting to get into, so there's been, a, there's been an explosion in the, contract extraction uh, space over the last year or two, three years maybe. Um, a lot of products coming in, into that space. Um, uh, and now you're starting to see some automated generation. So I think you'll see more and more generations. It's kind of the next step, right? So I can understand what's coming in. If it stands to reason that I should also now be able to create something in response to what came in. And it doesn't have to be contracts. It can be other things. Uh, LegalMation, for example, does this with complaints. They, a complaint is served. They can automatically, within like 30 seconds, create um, a bespoke uh, response, answer, RFP, and interrogatory uh, off of that. Um, and they're doing that in six states currently. So that, that's, that's a big deal. Um, I also think that the sort of second level opportunities that I talked about, that more and more the work that we're doing is becoming digital, um, that will allow uh, new opportunities that we can't even necessarily think about or understand yet. Um, that if, if, if things are native digitally, I heard that earlier today, it's such a great expression, um, that, that the, there's just so many other things that, you can, that you're going to be able to do that. Analytical stuff, predictive modeling, just uh, ease of workflow, uh, uh, immutability, all of those things potentially can start to come online. So two reasons to be bullish, no reasons to be cautious. You only asked for the bullish ones so far. <laughs> Do you, have a, do you have a top three to be cautious? I think there's going to be some consolidation in, in some of the tech space. There's just too many. Um, t so, like, if you were to join a tech company, be prepared because maybe you're going to join another one soon. <laughs> uh, that, might be, that might be something that could occur. I don't know um, anyone like that on the panel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what else did I have? Let's see here. Um, you know, uh, what is, uh, it, it's moving quick, which is what tech does. So if the, if the, the, the tech that you're betting on, um, while it might be bleeding edge today, very quickly could become commodity technology, which by the way is exactly what happens. You know, as, as soon as we implement a new technology that is ooze and ahs in the demo, 
the moment after we implement it, it becomes all about what is, what's the workflow to get the data in and out of that, and it quickly becomes just software, right? Fascinating. What about you, Carrie? From where you said you join us from the West Coast. Thank you so much for <laughs> leaving sunny California for us. So um, what about you? What, what's your read on the legal tech sector? So I'd say um, bullish on the opportunities that exist. There's tons of greenfield that's been discussed all through the day. There's plenty of opportunities to innovate. Um, you can kind of copycat what's been done, done in other industries, and there's a there's opportunity there. Um, I think I think AJ um, from Everlaw actually touched on a lot of awesome points. Um, I kind of want to steal his deck and use it as a recruiting aid, but we probably compete for the same engineers, so uh, he probably won't send it to me or he'll, he'll modify it. But, but um, the rule of law issue, um, I think, was one that you brought up. Um, LexisNexis's motto, or not motto, it's a mission statement. So above all the principles and OKRs and vision, highest thing is, is spreading the rule of law around the world. And so that has been an incredible um, statement in terms of being able to recruit people to work in the industry um, or for our company. Um, it's been good for getting customers. Um, and the reason is that, and this, this relates to why legal tech is, is I think, growing and, and awesome, is it really touches everybody's lives. That law is the you know, property rights are fundamentally enforced by law. Um, financial transactions are law. Um, the way you interact with the state is law. Um, part of why you came to, well, that's why you came to law school is you wanted to, to get into, into this kind of stuff, so you know this. Um, and then third, I'd say, I'd kind of step back, step back and look at just the industry generally. There's a lot more interest in, in, from an investment perspective. We saw the big Clio um, investment recently. Axiom Legal coming close to an IPO and then deciding to go, I think, a private equity route. Don't quote me on that. Um, and um, um, just lots of uh, mergers and, and stuff going on in the industry generally. And then, yeah, just the, like the Ernst & Young buying um, Pangea, Pangea 3 um, from Thomson Reuters. Yeah, so all of, all of that, just there's so much activity that if you don't want to look at the first principles and rule of law and you want to step back and just kind of read the cliff notes, look at what's going on, um, this is creeping closer and closer to the front, straight, front page of the Wall Street Journal every day. So um, this is a good time to get into it. I wouldn't give, uh, that's my honest advice. So. so overall, very bullish, right? We have a lot of greenfield application. Rule of law is now a very sexy mission to attract NLP engineers. I got that there's plenty of capital investment out there. But each of those statements can have a flip side, That's right? right? Um, so uh, what's the flip side of those stories? Sure. So I think there's a reason there's plenty of opportunities in. So the first one, yeah, um, legal field having a lot of opportunity. There's a reason. Why, didn't, why hasn't anybody done it before? It can be very hard, I think, especially because we're working with the interface between private sector or individuals and, and um, government and, and uh, systems of laws. Um, you have, there's a lot of reasons that the innovation that occurred in other sectors hasn't happened. I think part of it is cautiousness. Um, uh, the judiciary isn't always, um, is very protective um, with good reasons of rule of law again, but also um, often isn't even bound by, say, uh, statutory change. If there's questions of due process, um, they can, uh, the judiciary can, for example, uh, decide maybe a virtual court, I guess, um, I'm not Richard Susskind here right now, but the, the idea of virtual court, are there questions of due process involved with beaming somebody in? Um, one person has a better connection than the other. Or the circumstance of um, statistical um, uh, outcomes for cases when you have a backlog in, in Brazil of 100 million cases, was the, was the quote he provided. Um, can, is, is the due process clause of the Constitution, various due process clauses, are those violated by a statistical sort of or technology-driven approach to justice. Um, and so it becomes hard when you have very serious restrictions on innovation for good reason to make change. So I think that's, that's one big one. I think the law firm model that uh, Professor Wilkins discussed and others um, from the, the uh, uh, in-house panel discussed, um, Meredith and others, I think, yeah, the, the, the way the business works the efficiencies in, do not always turn up in profits, especially at law firms. And so there is reasons why people don't want to innovate in the way that they might in other fields. I think it's solvable, but um, yeah. And then thirdly, I think just that legal issues, while they touch on everyone's lives, they also are not your day-to-day -day concern a lot of the time. So there are key moments in your life or in business operations that they are critical. 
but often the, it's not on the top three list of what a CEO is thinking about day to day, and so it's not getting prioritized. There's not always a chief legal officer. You know, there's 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 often a general counsel, but um, the 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 top three that the the CEO or the individuals thinking about those just legal issues might not be the issue, and so they get deprioritized. So I'd say those are the drawbacks. It's easier to, to look at sales rather than legal a lot of the time. But if legal becomes top three, then I think they have serious trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Niha? What's your diagnostic of the legal tech industry? Yeah, um, I think most of my points have been covered. I'll just add one thing. This could be both a reason to be bullish or a reason to be cautious, depending on your position. But I think, as Professor Wilkins was saying, there's a huge talent crunch. If you're a law school student graduating from HLS, you're basically like almost guaranteed a job that's really well paying and that's pretty stable for the first few years at least. If you're an engineer, again, you're basically guaranteed a job that's really well paying and really stable. So to go into this industry, you need a certain level of like passion for the industry and tolerance for risk. And if you're trying to hire these people, it's tough and it's a reason to be cautious. But if you're one of the people trying to get into the industry, then I think it's a reason to be bullish because there is a need for people who want to be here. Great. So uh, that actually naturally segments into our next section about career advice, right? So. Um, Let's start with uh, someone who actually has a very long career <laughs> on the panel. So Jeff, what, what do you think? Looking back, um, what would you offer some of words of wisdom to uh, lawyers? I, I just got called old. <laughs> um, uh, career advice. Uh, don't get old. Uh, no. um, so for me, right, um, I, I just tried to stay aware of, of what I thought was interesting technology um, all through my career. Mostly just because I'm like a geek and really enjoy technology, so I, um, I guess I would say like, don't be afraid to like follow the things that you're interested in. I mean, if you're interested in a career in technology, then you should definitely be paying attention to technology. You should be paying attention to legal technology if you're interested in that space. But don't be afraid to look at all the other technology that's out there. User interfaces in in legal tech are being compared to the user interfaces at Google and Amazon and Apple and all the rest. So you should understand the base levels of technology and the sort of Game of Thrones that's occurring in those in those uh, um, economies. Um, but also, I would say uh, really strongly, like you need to like. I worry that I've had a very broad and varied career, and I, I feel like that is finally benefiting me, maybe not earlier on, because some might call it uh, attention deficit disorder. But, um, but now that's paying off. I would, I would very much, uh, we talked about T lawyers, T-shaped lawyers earlier, very much like don't be afraid to learn from anywhere else uh, about what you're doing. Don't, uh, don't get siloed in and have your blinders on because of the education that you're getting. Keep your head up and keep looking around because opportunity could be all over the place where you can apply what you've learned in school or where you've learned throughout your career. I know that's kind of general, but that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of my thing is. That's why we call it advice, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about Carrie? So um, you were among the ones that described by Niha, right? had a very stable job, graduating from law school, and you went to become a litigator. Then, uh, then now at the legal tag, which then was acquired by a bigger company. Um, so. What next for you? And then, what's your word of wisdom for uh, whoever's watching the video? JD is like studying, outlining, and putting this in the background. All right, dear world. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So next for me, um, I've so I've found a career that I truly love, um, which is product management. So I hope lawyers aren't sucky at product management. Way to lead it off with that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, but but that said, I. Still, I'm a member of the California State Bar. I still practice law. Um, I do a lot of pro bono. Um, I advise nonprofits. Uh, I used to do more commercial just side projects. I bought some malpractice insurance so I could advise small businesses. My point here is that keeping your legal skills sharp, especially if you like practicing law, um, I think can be really helpful in doing your core job if you work in legal tech, which is going to involve empathizing with customers. So I highly encourage um, there's many ways to do this. One size does not fit all. I think the people in this room have self-selected into learning as much as they can about legal technology. Um, so I would give a very different advice to the general population. For you, I would say if you have an interest, at least moderate 
too severe case of, <laughs> of liking the law, practice law. Go, you will be highly compensated if you want, or you'll have um, almost any opportunity available to you, um, especially considering your backgrounds here. So embrace those. Legal tech will not uh, turn you away later if you decide to spend a couple of years or a couple of decades practicing law. The legal tech is not going away. So uh, there's, yeah, FOMO is one thing, so don't miss out, but it, we'll be here for you. Yeah. Hope to hire some of you someday, so. Does anyone, <laughs> uh, does anyone know what FOMO is? Everyone knows? I'm old, I know what it means. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're on the East Coast. <laughs> we're on the East Coast. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so Niha, right? So we, we, when we were coordinating this panel, um, Carrie just, without knowing who Neha was, just jumped straight in and said, my career advice is for anyone who wants to go into legal tech to practice law for a few years, and you'll be able to empathize the other side better. And then I said to Neha, what do you say to that? You jump straight into legal tech. Yeah, um, I think that that's still really good advice. I knew what I wanted to do on day zero, like I said, but I think if you're unsure, it doesn't hurt to practice at all. That will only help you. And I think that actually leads into my advice, which is that there's a traditional path for being a lawyer, which is law school, maybe clerkship, then law firm, then in-house, and then government job or whatever. There's no such path for being in this field, not yet. So you really have to make your own path, and it will look very different from everybody else's path. That's what I've learned. So you have a very um, incredible combination of credentials, right? So it's not every day that someone graduates CMU and decides to just go do a law degree, and it's not every day someone graduated at Harvard Law to just decide to do a computer science degree. But yes, you have the perfect profile, but not a lot of people have best sides of, you know, both, best of both worlds. So can you offer a little bit of advice to someone who come out of like law school, kind of know what legal tech is doing, a little bit worried, like, is this going to take my job away, um, but don't really want to learn coding, should they learn coding? Um, What's your advice to you, lawyers who are tangentially interested or intimidated by this field, but doesn't just doesn't want to um, do the hardcore science and vice versa, right? How do you speak to the computer scientists who see this? Oh, this looks like an interesting nascent field doing meaningful work, but uh, I don't know if I want to work with lawyers. Like, what what's your advice to to both sides? Yeah, I think you don't have to know everything to be successful. It you just have to want to be there and be willing to learn, but you don't have to come in with credentials or anything. At my workplace, I had this coworker, Kathy, and she graduated from law school. She never had a tech background, and now she can talk to the engineers really fluently. She knows everything about the technology, and she is fantastic. And I have another coworker, Jordan. He's an engineer. He never went to law school, never knew anything about law before he started working. And now he can talk to you about anything related to startup law, and he will be able to answer any questions you have. Of course, he'll have a disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. But he knows as much as any lawyer does at this point. So the, so the feel is kind of adaptive enough that someone doesn't start with the right background and can still merge into it and become super fluent. That, that's, that's comforting news. Um, so I'm going to open up for questions unless anyone have like burning comments to make. Like, okay. I, I had one thing, and yes. it's not burning, but I just, <laughs> and I'm interested in Niha's uh, thought on it. So I have this theory that developers, engineers, software engineers, and lawyers really aren't that far apart. That they both have a highly technical training, right? Um, they both have their own languages, tend to declare variables up front and then call <laughs> them later. You know, it's really, really not that different. Yeah. What, what do you think? I totally agree. I think the kind of analysis that you do in both fields is really similar. You're make, doing very rigorous analysis. It's not like creative writing. You're going yeah. through the steps. You have a process to follow, and you try to do it rigorously. Yeah. yeah. Agree. OK, cool. See it. AJ up there. Yeah. In my mind, as an undergrad major in math, I have a the connection between math and law is really clear. In both, in both fields, you have uh, a set of simple axioms, relatively simple, and math, you combine them in interesting ways. And really interesting emergent properties, right? Like what happens in a, in a mathematical system and in the law, similar, you get a bunch of laws, but what happens when you put them together and yes. figure it out? I think there's a lot of analogies there. That's interesting. And the LSAT is just great for math. <laughs> <laughs> Which section of LSAT? Any question for the LSAT, I would just be really fun to do. <laughs> <laughs>
fantastic. Not the writing with pencil part, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, so we're gonna open up for, for questions. This is the silence between us and the reception. And, uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, to the recent grads and the less recent grads, uh, among your classmates, how do they go about uh, discovering the interest in legal technology? Like what, what kinds of things are, are they exposed to that would cause them to discover? He has cases, she came to it before, but how would a classroom spend it? Yeah, um, I actually think it's increasing every year. You can really see the change. So this January was the first time the law school had two classes in its J term, which is a month long term, that were teaching computer programming to lawyers. And I was a teaching assistant for one of them. And you could see people, it was a three week course. And by week two, they were thinking, how can I go into a law firm and do some of this? How do I convince the partner to let me solve some problems this way? So I think as soon as they get like, like I said, two weeks of exposure, the change happens, and the law school is starting to introduce more classes that help people get that initial exposure. Oh, go ahead. You I'll go quickly. I, I, I think, um, I, I'll say right after graduation, so I haven't been in law school now for almost about seven years, so, uh, but it was maybe the year after law school that um, in, on the West Coast, you often end up advising startup companies, growth companies, and you start to see um, the types of solutions that, that tech companies are providing to their clients, and um, I've had classmates uh, who were recent graduates at the time who wondered uh, also why can't we provide those types of solutions in, in law. So um, just kind of seeing it from your clients, I think that's, that's actually a good, good way to see it. Um, this was, I meant to mention this during the advice piece. Um, if you're really interested in legal technology and you want to understand the ecosystem a little bit better, um, Professor Wilkins talked about clock. Um, uh, being a part of that organization is, is very interesting. Um, I've been to the last three now. Um, and then there's uh, other trade shows. Uh, there's Legal Week in New York in, at the end of January. Um, go buy a ticket for a day and walk around the floor. Just walk around the floor and check out what's going on because you will all, it will just open your, uh, your mind a little bit. We had a, um, we had a, a clerk that uh, went to Legal Week last year, ended up meeting a pretty famous guy named Dave Cambria, uh, who's at Baker Hostetler, and has gone to work for him uh, just because he met him on the floor. And now he's doing legal ops within Baker Hostetler. So, uh, yes, Mackenzie? I always get the, it's Mackenzie, I always get the Bakers mixed up. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> um, so I would, you know, that's an investment in your future. It, they're not cheap, but um, oftentimes there's student discounts, and I think there's some scholarship stuff that happens, especially with clock. Um, I would, I would go spend a day on the floor. Well, another tip is um, just be friends with someone who's going. Sometimes I have uh, sponsorship free passes, and you can just there you go. Like, tag along. Oh, um, for me, it was simple. I just took Professor Wilkins' class and Don Rowland, who's <laughs> things here, um, took uh, Don Rowland's class. That was about it. Is there any student in here, by the way? Or are we talking to the camera only? Okay, I'm gonna cold call. So as someone in the back, yes. Thinking about computational systems, your computer systems in law, if you're talking, you know, there's high frequency trainings, contracts and structured purchase transactions, and um, you know, there's different areas where the law computes. But what do you think would be the kind of laws or legal instruments or legal processes that are, that are the best fits for expressing themselves computationally, but that haven't yet hit in the market? That's a very high class question. Um, who wants to take a step? Can you repeat the last, sorry, just for my benefit, I don't think I fully understand the question. You've got data, you've yeah. got software, and it does stuff. Banking and finance all yeah. over it for decades, law not so much, but we're starting. E-discovery is a good example of a legal process that's finally becoming more computational. Where's the white space and where, where do you think, where would be a particularly good fit that doesn't yet exist? I'd, I'd suggest, uh, I'll give a short answer. I think um, like rights management, licensing of digital rights for images, um, music, um, anything where you, you know, license some portion of a, um, of a kind of created work 
um, for certain purposes, some, some stick from that bundle of rights, um, as a property professor might say in, back in my day. Um, <laughs> Um, I think that would be a good place to start. I, how I would do it, I don't know. It's very fun to say the B word. Um, they say blockchain here. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, I said it, sorry. You can, you can beep that out on the, uh, on the camera. You're talking about future and all the past. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, are you hinting at smart contracts, Daza? Are you, no. No? Are you trying to get at something else? Do it if you want, but I'm, I'm right with deleting the B word and uh, <laughs> dealing with systems that exist on Earth today. Okay, gotcha. Um, existing systems. I have to think about that one for a little bit. Is the question more about what kind of unique innovation we're going to see in legal field, or is it what technology exists that's seen awesome application like banking finance and other sectors that we can adapt into legal sector, but we have yet to? The latter, um, like what do you think would be a particularly good fit? Like everyone here is into the topic and you guys are living it every day on this uh, panel. Um, there's a lot of capabilities of technologies that exist and there's a lot of needs for capabilities to operate, you know, um, as some um, applications and services online in the law. Um, it seems like it's still very early days. And I was just thinking, in particular, the question was, you know, the reason I asked the question, I was like, well, they're all living and breathing it now. Where, have they ever thought, oh, that would be something that would hit now? Like, what might be next in line? Is like, if this was 1999, I'd be asking, what's the killer app for law? Actually, in my line of work, I'm actually trying to solve the reverse, right? So how do we make AI more explainable? Uh, we're actually trying to see, like, how can we integrate the subject matter expertise a little bit more into AI. So we're trying to uh, do the reverse trend um, than, than most AI companies. I think that is the, the more difficult. I'm not sure that's the sexiest technology uh, challenge, but I do think that it's uh, uh, the fascinating problem for us. Thank you, that was really interesting. And I wanted to ask about, in terms of being able to have the biggest impact on the practice of law, can that be done from inside a legal company or as a startup from outside can we disrupt and all the different uh, considerations there? That's a very ambitious question. Um, Neha? Yeah, I don't think there's a set answer to that yet. People are forging their own paths because everything's so new. I think Professor Wilkins, that slide he showed, just showed you like the different challenges of doing it in different ways. So if you go into a law firm, you have the advantage of already having clients, so you can get a lot of client feedback, which is really helpful because you know exactly what they want. Your problems are more coming from the way that the law firm itself is set up. I think if you go to a tech firm, you have the opposite problem. The setup of the tech firm like enables innovation, that's what it's for. But then you might have to interface with lawyers to get to the clients, and that adds the friction and barrier. Yeah, I would, I would say Neha answered it exactly the way I would. Yeah. I, I think that uh, the disruption tends to come from uh, startups more often than not. But I think that there are large corporations out there that have disrupted things significantly. You know, um, so so it can be done. Uh, it tends to move a little bit slower for us, though. We just have so many so many things, so many wheels in motion. Don't you think what's going to happen? What's happening though is that the startups are being consolidated into bigger and bigger things, and you've got big players now moving into the market. So your point about so when are the fintech companies just going to come into law? Why should they wait for other people to adapt it? You know, and if you look at all the intersections. If you look at where the big four is coming, Oracle's now coming into the space. Yeah. I mean, I just think, so I think the real question's gonna be uh, what happens with all the kind of consolidation of the future. I mean, there was a very, very brilliant innovative company that was bought into a bigger company. And, and you know, that has challenges about how that works out. If you look at, I'm not gonna talk about it, you can look at Tops of Reuters. There's a reason why Pangea 3 got spun back out again, because they didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. And um, I think EY, I think the big four are gonna be very formidable competitors, because they've already been doing a lot of this. Yeah. But then, you know, let's see. I mean, you know, because they've also had their challenges in integrating new technologies and whatnot. So I think it's a really interesting question, and I think what you're saying is there's space on all sides of this, yep. but there is consolidation coming. Law is the most fragmented trillion dollar business in the world. I mean, there's nothing else that remote, no law firm or legal provider has more than 1% of the market. About 
and no, nobody probably has one for seven. There's nothing else you could say where that's true, and that's unlikely to. And there's regulation that kind of stops it, and there's practices and there's norms, but there's definitely you see the consolidation already. David, I would just add to that, um, wait till liberalization of our regulations yeah, exactly start here right. in the U.S., right? And we've already started to see that in certain jurisdictions with uh, limited practice liability professionals yes. that are able to do certain transactions that are not lawyers. So as soon as law firms can start accepting outside money and the ABA gets comfortable around some of these protectionist kind of you know, create the mode around our, our practice and that starts changing, that'll even accelerate it even further. That's totally right. Multidisciplinary practice will be here in the United States in relevant jurisdictions yeah. in the next three to five years. There's no question about it. And that's going to jumpstart a huge amount because then you're going to get outside capital coming in. Yes. I mean, you know, if Clio's getting $250 million and LegalZoom's getting $500 million, imagine, you know, like what you could invest in Block Town. Mm -hmm. You know, or I mean, there's a bunch of possibilities out there that are, I think, going to become very attractive. Okay, get Bob's question here. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to comment actually on Daza's question about sort of what's the fintech tech, and I, and I was going to give Carrie a plug <laughs> because oh, I, I I think what LexisNexis is doing, not just LexisNexis, other companies are doing it, but doing with analytics is probably one of the least appreciated areas of legal tech and. and perhaps one of the most impactful in the sense that they are taking data that's been readily available to us for a long time, going into court dockets and pulling this stuff out uh, and, and, and allowing us to see stuff about the cases that we're working on, about the law, the, the context uh, technology he was talking about before, uh, is, is letting us see how judges decide things in ways we've never been able to see before. And it's, it's really impactful in the way it's changing uh, the practice of law, particularly in litigation, but with applications outside of that as well. So. And that, that's where. Well, <laughs> I, I think that there, there, there line, there's some um, conflict between the definition of impact here. I picked up a little bit, like from Professor Wilkins, is you know, the most ubiquitous application what is like the minimum you can launch to get the highest dollar amount, right? And Bob's comment basically says, well, sometimes you need to do the really hard stuff, that's, but then it's underappreciated, but then it's nonetheless super impactful. So I guess to summarize this incredibly rich uh, answer to your question is I think um, there's just really, it depends on what your definition of, of impact is. And they're really, I think the exciting thing about this field is it allows for multiple possible definitions of impact, right? If you go to big law, it's just billable hours. Um, but then in legal tech, there really is a diversity of how do you define impact that I find very fascinating. Yes? I was going to offer another suggestion to that question about another area, legal or legal adjacent, if anyone wants to start another startup. I would love this one. Uh, this is around privacy. Uh, and in the rest of the world, or at least in Europe, are pretty far along in privacy, the GDPR. California, where I live, has consumer privacy law. Uh, it's really hard for businesses to manage and for consumers to have transparency into the visibility and access of their personal data by, or by corporations. So I think an awesome startup would be something that bridged the two, that provided a platform that showed users where their data was stored and gave them control over it, the, the control that the law demands. Uh, and also, uh, that would let the, the kind of the, the corporate entities plug into that uh, to make it easy for them to be compliant. You know, right now, California has a law; it's the only one. It's probably going to be 20 more in the next five or 10 years. I don't think we're going to get a federal level, but 20. Imagine trying to comply with 20 different state privacy regulations, right? And GDPR. Uh, so this not only makes it easier and more cost efficient for corporations to comply with these regulations, it also does right by the consumers who have the right and should have the right to control their private data. So I think that'll be really cool. I hope someone does it. So uniform. I, I think AJ is talking about rec tech, um, but I, I can tell you that on the flip side, though, for vendors who live in the GDPR world, what that really means is whenever you try to sell the law firm, you get this like 200 question questionnaires about your security practice. Um, so I think there are like both sides to, to that coin. But I do want to leave the last question to a student in the room. 
because I know everybody else like running to each other at conferences all the time. You probably are aware of each other's views and uh, on first name basis as we see. Um, is there any student in the room who have some burning questions? to add to the discussion from what I understand, what I understood is that in both scenarios, if I would go to legal tech or if I go to a law firm, so, sometime in my career, I'll be demanded this skill in coding, in programming. So how much of this skill and where do we, we start? I mean, um, a general understanding of Python would give me the skill set to, you know, deal with data issues, um, which language would you guys recommend and how much of a skill someone who is trying to follow up at on a law firm would need, would be demanded? I think that's a very uh, good question. I, is, do we still have some law firm folks in the room? Is Meredith still here? No, no she had Janet, to go. Janet left. Um, Okay. So I guess you're the only law firm. Yeah, so I would, my hopefully brief answer would be to, um, you're not gonna, unless you really want to be the specialist and wanna educate yourself you know, while doing your job to become that specialist, you'll probably only need to understand um, parts of the technology and understand the, the, the stack, the architecture um, abstractly. And so if you want to develop some technical skills, find the area that you find most interesting if it's front end, do some JavaScript. If you're interested in the data engineering, do, um, or, or data science, do some whatever. You can do some Python, do some R. Um, but I would recommend finding the area that interests you. You may not be interested in writing uh, Scala API code um, to deal with the you know, passing stuff to the front end from the back end. So find what you think will keep you um, able to understand the big picture and kind of dabble in that. That's my recommendation. Work with good people who have the special special skills. That question assumed that you have to learn coding. I'm not sure that assumption is. I don't think true. you have to learn. I, I agree. You, I don't think you don't you don't need to learn coding unless you want to. But you need yeah. to understand how software is built and how it runs, right. in the market. Yeah. yeah, that's the most important. What makes a good product is very interesting. Or work at Google before you uh, go to law school, like some somebody in this room. So. Fantastic. So. Uh, I think we'll leave it at that unless someone has like last question. All good. Great. Um, before we break for free drinks, I just really want to say like thank you, Robert. He is the most ambitious conference organizer I have ever met. So everybody, big round of applause. <laughs>